You're listening to Gender, A Wider Lens. I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Since 2016, my practice has been exclusively dedicated to gender questioning teens and families impacted by gender dysphoria. I also work with gender questioning teenagers and I facilitated support meetings for families and individuals who have been impacted by gender issues. We're curious about the concept of gender and how it's unfolding in the wider culture. Join us as we look at gender through a wider lens. Hello there, Stella. Hi, Sasha. I'm looking forward to this episode. Oh, yes. I think we've been saying that for lots of episodes. <laughs> have we? <laughs> yeah. yeah we have. But it's all fascinating. And I do want to preface it with every one of these episodes we just touch upon. We open it up because that's the idea that we're opening up the conversation. Yeah. And today we're going to give a, a, an introduction to very, very important topic, which is gender dysphoria in boys. And, you know, we're aware Um, that parents of boys have often felt kind of neglected by the movement to, you know, prevent childhood transition or to bring light to this topic. And every time boys are discussed when they are, which isn't often, you know, we, we will hear about the typologies and the research of Ray Blanchard and autogynephilia, which are, um, you know, categories that were perhaps relevant at a a different point in time, which continue to be relevant. But you and I have have kind of observed that there's something else going on here. So we have to broaden the way we talk about this. And we're hoping to do that today. Yeah. And I think that's why it's so important that we, for me, that we got this episode out is because people presume they have a handle on all this all these boys. And I I think, nah, they don't. And it's lovely to see there's been some articles recently in the media about the boys and it's great to see it. But the sooner we get it out there, like kind of quite strongly, that there's a whole other category that hasn't really been um, categorized and, and needs to be and needs to be brought into the conversation so that we get a deeper understanding of these boys. That's right. And with with all of these categories, you know, we ascribe various descriptors um, and traits to a group of people, and there's always overlap, right? So these old categories that Ray Blanchard has developed and come up with probably overlap with some of what we're seeing today. And yet sometimes there are um, kind of unique and distinct Uh, expressions of gender dysphoria that may not have been reflected in Dr. Blanchard's research in the past. So do do we want to start, I guess, with kind of a historical look back on, you know, what what do we know historically about gender dysphoria or what was then called transsexualism in males? Well, I think Ray Blanchard was a a sexologist that he kind of um, built upon a lot of the work that had already been done that we have discussed in previous episodes in the kind of 50s, 60s, 70s. And then in the 80s and 90s, Ray Blanchard came out in a very, I think, very clear minded way um, that there was types of transsexual. And he wasn't really very focused on the women because they weren't coming up in the numbers. So he didn't have to worry about them. And he was very much focused on what, why were some men seeking to transition? And he really identified, as far as I could see, two main groups that were the, the primary reasons why they would be dr- driven to, tra- to transition. And they were the homosexual, transsexual, the autogynephiliac. For, that's certainly my, my terms for them. And people run with that. And that's from the 80s and 90s. And it's arguable that there's more, there's more to be said. But when he, when he did kind of devise it, it was accepted as far as I can see. And it was accepted as a very kind of definitive, established, documented and, and researched category. And it's only like 30, 40 years later, it became controversial. Mm -hmm. And it was accepted, you know, by, by very open-minded Uh, researchers and sexologists and scientists. I mean, Anne Lawrence was a researcher who herself was a transsexual woman, and she endorsed Blanchard's typology. So we're not just talking about, you know, some sort of 
conservative, bigoted people who are trying to demonize transsexualism. These are scientists and researchers who are earnestly attempting to understand the motivations that lie behind people's desire to medically transition. Yeah. And according to Ray Blanchard, there was two main. The homosexual transsexual was incredibly feminine from feminine from the from the time they were born, really. Like they were just an, an incredibly feminine, incredibly girlish boy who maintained that femininity. You know, and I know people might be rolling their eyes and saying, what is femininity? But classical gender roles um, and was, you know, it's very interesting when you look up the types, and I do urge any listeners who are interested to look it up because they literally, they look feminine, they act feminine, they speak feminine, they have high voices and they kind of, they really envelop the the classically very feminine w- woman. And that is one type, not a type that I would argue you see very much of. You know, I, I would wonder if we were working with younger teenagers, if we would see more uh, feminine males who are interested in transition. I I have seen some males that fall into that category. And yet, you know, the fact that there is a cultural concept for, you know, being trans or having a different gender identity, I'm sure captures all of these young males or most of them. Because, you know, these are probably young men who, from a very young age, connected well with girls and felt like they fit in in female peer groups. And so certainly they, they could probably relate very much to femaleness and to girlhood. And so having this concept of gender identity would probably click very, very well with the experiences of boys like this. Yeah. And as I said to you before we start recording, I do have a friend who I think definitely was in that category and is in that category. And Maybe he should have transitioned. Certainly he speaks about it quite wistfully now and he'd be middle-aged now. And you could say maybe in another era he would have transitioned and it might have worked out very well for him. Um, and maybe he still could, of course. Um, but, you know, so I do have a very, very, very um, long established relationship with somebody where you could see, you could see this personality. And, I, you know, I know it very well as a result. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that I remember um, Dr. Michael Bailey talked about in his book, The Man Who Would Be Queen, was that, you know, men who pursue this kind of transition and live as women are interested in relationships with men. And so they may have, you know, more success, I guess, in some ways, being a very attractive looking um, trans woman who transitioned at a pretty young age, who... Um, passes pretty well in society, perhaps it's easier to gain, um, you know, a relationship with a male partner in that way. Now, you know, it's also tough because there, there is, in my experience, a lot of fetishization of trans women and, and they can be treated in a way that is not given enough dignity and respect. So it's complicated, right? Mm. But um, that is quite different from the other typology that Blanchard identified, which maybe we can shift over to, which is the autogynephilic transsexual. And so again, these are terms developed at the time. Probably people don't really use these terms much today, but this is a a male person who is kind of aroused by the idea of himself as a woman. And from watching, you know, interviews and conversations where um, men who self identify as autogynephilic, they describe their experiences. It's really fascinating because it seems to be a powerful, powerful um, a kind of disconnect that feels very awkward and clumsy to, to recognize yourself as a male, but want very much to become a woman and fantasize about yourself as a woman and the type of sexual attention also that they perceive they will receive as a woman. I mean, it's so complicated. And I imagine that this is just a very touchy idea because everybody involved, whether you are, a, you know, a straight woman listening in or an, a, a female who is a lesbian listening in, or if you're a male who is straight, this is an odd, odd condition 
I actually remember where I was standing the first time I heard about it. I remember it was James Caspian, the uh, the psychotherapist who's brilliant and has worked in trans for, for, for many, many years. He explained it. At, I was literally standing in his kitchen going, oh, oh. <laughs> like it was a whole, a whole kind of planet opened up. And I, I literally, I remember exactly the moment of, oh. So what it is, as you said, you know, it's from the Greek, love of oneself as a woman. And it's, it's, it's the male propensity to be sexually aroused by the thought of themselves as a woman. That is a complicated sentence. Yes. <laughs> and it is. It is fascinating because it goes in all sorts of different ways. So you could be aroused as your for as yourself as a woman in a very kind of you know very kind of uh, slutty kind of way where you'd wear really kind of um, overtly kind of sexual clothes as a man you know but as a woman if you follow me that's the it has to be a man who is an autogynephiliac. but also it can be with things like breastfeeding and menstruation and ironing and wearing kind of real dowdy clothes and being a, a real kind of librarian woman. Like it's all sorts of different ways to be a woman. It's not just the classically sexual kind of ripe woman. There's loads of ways to be aroused as, of, aroused as yourself as a woman. And so it seeps into everything. And it does explain why so many men, if they do have autogynophile tendencies they want to be deeply want to be accepted as a woman because they feel they that that's the entire concept yeah is treat me as a woman otherwise the whole stack of cards falls Mm -hmm. well there's a revulsion to the fact of their maleness i mean that's the sense that i get it's so disruptive and disturbing and so being reminded of this kind of permanent fact of life um, goes directly in opposition to the kind of attempted fantasy and illusion they are trying to create. Yeah, and that makes it really, really hard. Like Ray Blanchard, when he when he said it, he did absorb part of that word, autogynophilia, uh, absorbs transvestites. And, you know, I do think that like in the 80s and the 90s, that there was, you know, there was an awful lot of daytime TV shows, you know, saying, you know, the man who had transvestitism and things like that. And we were very accepting of it. And I think that has got kind of, it has got subsumed into the, the trans umbrella. So in 1996, they, they, they moved from transsexual and transvestite into one word, which is transgender. And that's very much, you know, rooted in where Ray Blanchard was going. And I can see where he was going with it. Like I say, not controversial at the time. Everybody was nodding along. All the experts were just, you know, understanding it all. And then in 2003, maybe Mike, Mike Bailey uh, decided to write the book, The Man Who Would Be Queen. Great book and massive controversy followed because what you were allowed to say in 1989 about autogynophilia, you were not allowed to say in 2003. And it became a much more controversial term. And then people started to deny its existence. Like very late in the day, I would say, they started to say, oh, it's it's a bad word. It's filled with shame. And we, we should, um, well, we shouldn't say it and we shouldn't describe anybody as it, as opposed to saying nobody should be ashamed for their erotic fixations. Erotic fixations, as you know, I always think of, you know, sex is weird. Like what, what turns you on and what turns me on? It would make your head spin. And so what turns the autogynophile on is what it turns them on. You know, I, I, I'm not sure what we can do about that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it would probably take a great amount of, you know, self-honesty and a commitment to not delude oneself to be able to say, I have this experience where I recognize myself as male, yet I am also repulsed by that. And yet I still know that I am male-bodied person, whether they transition or not, you know, I think it would take a great amount of um, clarity and self-acceptance to come to that point. And I think that's part of the reason why some activism is so intent 
on just erasing that fact that autogynephilia exists and that some male people are just trying to erase the existence of their maleness. And if they can convince everybody else to erase it as well, then they have what they want. You know, they don't have to really confront that fact anymore. And that's arguably the root of trans women are women. It's arguably the root of of a lot of the, the current movement is driven by this desire. Not necessarily, but it's certainly arguable. I know trans women like Debbie Hayton, you know, she she's a self-confessed as such, I shouldn't use that word, but self-described um, autogynophile. And she's, you know, she's she's like says, yeah, and loads of loads of them do. And I I welcome them. I welcome them to say, yeah, yeah. Listen, honestly, if you had to get inside my head and find, find out what turns me on, you'd probably all be appalled. So <laughs> I'm not mm. going to be appalled by anybody else's. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. that's. That's life. The key part of it is when one person's erotic fixation gets thrust upon another person's because that's part of their sexual predilection. And that's when it gets into very, very, I don't know, unfortunate waters where there could be some men who are determined to make you part of their erotic play because that's what's turning them on. And so they, they need other people. For example, like, you know, some people can get, especially men, can get turned on by the women's horror and disgust. And they're, they're literally, that's part of the erotic kind of, uh, uh, yeah, desire. They want people to be disgusted. They want people to look away in disgust. And so you become part of their sexual um play. I remember I used to have a clothes shop in, in my 20s and uh, this guy used to come in regularly and he used to dress up in clothes, in women's clothes in the shop. I, the shop was girls and boys, men's and women's and uh, then he would come out and he would quite clearly have an erection and look in the mirror. Now I was there in my early 20s didn't quite know how to handle this, you know what I mean? But was very aware, like, hang on, he's he's basically showing me his erection every time he comes into the shop and he's coming in very often. And I don't know what to do because, of course, I was a liberal, inclusive, you don't shame people. But I, as the, as the time went on, I thought, hang on a second, like, I, I'm I'm part of his afternoon kind of fun here. And I I, I was in a very uncomfortable now don't forget early 20s woman on her own in her little shop like right and you know and so an old school friend came in a very kind of grounded old school friend came in to visit me and we were having a coffee and who walks in but the guy for his for his afternoon event and um (laughs) um, he went in I I just said nothing I just continued talking with my friend and he went into the dressing room came out we could see his because he was wearing dresses from the shop that were really quite tight so you could see his erection which I was seeing let's face it every day at this stage (laughs) and my my friend's look of utter horror and disgust she was like and she was looking at me like is this seriously going on and I was going yeah it's a bit tricky this (laughs) And she was like, this is not tricky. This is a guy committing a sex act. And I realized, actually, I had I'd fallen into something out of an, a, a desire to be included. I didn't want to shame the guy, but I, I it, it all went very wrong, <laughs> you know, because you could see. Yeah. And that's what's very interesting with sex. You can see when somebody's in the middle of a sex act, because I, I could tell you lots of stories, but funnily enough, I'll just tell you one more quickly. When I was a kid, I had to go walk through woods to get to school. It was lovely woods. It was actually beautiful. But I was flashed at very, very, very often. Now, all these years later, I realized those flashers were waiting for me. At the time, I just thought I had, I know, poor like kid. Bad, like wrong place, wrong time. But you then realized they were waiting they for were you waiting to for walk me. by. Yeah, I thought um, I was wrong place, wrong time all the time. Because I knew there was flashes in the woods. Now I realised they were coming out at 20 to 9. School was starting. They knew that little girl was walking through. And, you know, and so that's why, like, I'm talking many, 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 many times I was flashed at because of this. But I didn't realise it. But again, I therefore, I know the, the sex face. 
do you follow me? They would have this sex face. Their face was kind of in sex and you'd recognize it. And that was just like that guy in the shop that he was in the middle of sex, if you follow me. And I was just standing there. Arousal. He was in arousal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And it's an unmistakable face, I think. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of women get very, very agitated because of all these sort of events. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, there are within the population of gender dysphoric males, there are all these kind of subcategories. And there is a, a percentage of these males who may genuinely get arousal from the kind of discomfort people have yeah. around the fact that they are, you know, presenting as female or in changing rooms. And I just want to point out, because one of the misconceptions that I think happens a lot for the ROGD boys is that there's always this kind of perhaps sexual gratification that comes from their trans identification. And that's not always the case at all. Right. So you're talking about your experiences where this man was clearly gratified by making you uncomfortable, kind of forcing you to look at his body and his erection. And yet what I see at least Um, with the young males that I'm aware of and that I've worked with or consulted with is these are kids that are really hiding away and they're quite terrified of people's attention and they're completely, um, not always, right? But many of them are quite, quite innocent sexually. And they, just like the girls, are vulnerable to getting wrapped up in this entire movement, which gives a new name to all kinds of experiences they're having throughout their adolescence. So it's complicated to talk about gender dysphoria in males because there is such a variety of ways that this will present. And depending on the person and their individual pathology, this could mean very different things for different males who are struggling, quote, with their gender. Yeah. And because it's complicated, I'm just going to recap that really yourself and myself and many other people who are working in this would agree that there's arguably three types. There's certainly the homosexual, transsexual, the very, very feminine boy who one day is transitions. Then there's the autogynophile who um, there's a few different types of autogynophile. It could be clothing. It could be behavioral. It could be physiological about body functions and it could be an anatomy, you know. So there's lots of different ways to be autogynophiliac. And then there's a third kind of category. And, you know, Angus Fox wrote about it in his Quillette piece. And there's been some great pieces by mothers, you know, saying, what is it? You're not trans. You're just weird. Brilliant piece. Really, really good. And these are the ROGD boys that you and I see. And, you know, um, like myself and Angus, because I'm, I'm friendly with them, we were called, calling it kind of trans ruminative. You know what I mean? Insofar as they're, these are, these are really ruminating excessively, hyper ruminative about trans, hyper rumination trans. And that would be, I would say, where these ROGD boys are. And they are arguably very far from, some of them are very far from autogynophilia. They're nowhere near autogynophilia and they're certainly nowhere near homosexual, transsexual. They're, they're, they're a category in their own. And then there's almost a fourth category which kind of slip into a bit of autogynophilia and they're, they're also scared and, and, and soft and gentle. It, it seems to me there is, there's some sort of other kind of overlap because um, boys are developing sexually. Some of them are frightened and they're shut down and they've shut their sexuality down. Some of them are compartmentalizing and they they have shut down, but there's there's there is some sort of autogynophilia in the background there. That's as far as I can see. I, as, as you know, I run the GDSN meetings, the the parents support meetings, and you know a lot of the mothers come on. We have meetings just for boys, just for parents of boys, because it's such a specific type. And with those, it's almost split. You'd almost say half and half because some of the mothers are saying, "I've checked the hard drive. My husband is." A tech genius. There is no hardcore porn. There's no kind of hypnosissy porn on this. There's nothing. This guy is not sexually developed. The other half are saying, I looked at his computer and oh my God, the stuff I saw was really, really extraordinary. It's hypnosissy porn all over the place. 
So it seems to me that there's a split. Would, would that fall in with where you're at? Yeah, I think that I think that's completely right. I mean, I think there's the really bright, maybe a little autistic um, kid who's very, very innocent, actually, and is kind of behind sexually from from their peers, um, who is also just kind of trying to find a way of explaining their odd quirkiness. And then there are boys who they're definitely feeling strong sexual urges, and they're quite malleable. You know, I know that some sexologists tend to view sexuality in these kind of rigid categories that you can't actually influence your sexual development. And I don't know if that's true. I'm not so sure. I think people can have leanings or propensities one way or another. And then if you take a young person who's in the throes of their kind of hormone surge and sexual development, and they're exposed to a lot of, um, pornography that indicates one thing or another, I know that can influence their sexuality. So with the the boys that you're talking about, Stella, where they kind of are like slightly autogynephilic or it seems like they are, I'm really curious about that. You know, perhaps they had a few experiences of, you know, trying on their mother's clothes as a kid or something, but then with enough you know, use of certain types of pornographic images, it can mold their sexual preferences. And I mean, I've, I've heard clients talk about how porn influences your sexual preferences, both, both boys and girls. So there's no doubt that the use of, you know, pornographic materials, especially nowadays, you know, there's all of these animated pornographic images, which basically means that the illustrators can go completely beyond the realms of what's even physically possible, Mm. which is terrifying when you think about it. So to to influence a young person's sexuality with cartoon images, I mean, porn already doesn't depict sex in a realistic way that's that's pleasurable for both people. Then you want to put images and cartoons that are completely made up and can do literally anything. I mean, that's that's a really powerful um, manipulative agent in my in my opinion. So I'm actually actually quite worried about the impact of porn on on teenagers because I've met so many teenagers, just clients that I've worked with who've been freaked out by the porn they've seen, who freak themselves out, who've got themselves very disturbed about the porn they've seen, girls and boys, not quite notably girls and boys. And I don't think really until this generation there was too many girls, teenage girls watching porn, but they are now. And that 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 does kind of make me think we really are living in a pornified culture. But also I've met so many boys who've who've got to places because of the algorithms and because of the way the porn industry, which are geniuses, continuously lure them into a little bit deeper, a little bit weirder, a little bit more novel. Why? Because testosterone thrives in novelty. And they end up in very fetishistic places that they were never going to be had they not started the kind of porn journey. And the, you know that ASMR porn, uh, uh, ASMR trans and ASMR trans porn and things like that, autonomous sensory meridian response or something like that. Anyway, it's 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 part of this new world, and you know the clients are telling me about it, and it's just like it's a world that you don't want, isn't it? It's a world that's just dark and disturbing and not exactly. It would be so much nicer if they were getting their sexual kicks in a in a more physical world than in this virtual, yeah. this virtual darkness that they seem to be at. Yeah, I've definitely heard clients say that, you know, upon reflecting, you know, they were kind of horrified by some of the things that ended up turning them on. So these are people who um, are not only just slowly geared towards various types of fetishistic preferences but actually if they have a moment to reflect they go oh god what am i looking at like this yeah. is not me so there's something about that you know the way y- you can end up somewhere very far from what you actually value or what you actually find erotic so that's dark when you think about how manipulated people's sexuality can become yeah yeah, I know. I know people who've told me what they've ended up looking at, and I'm saying it's illegal what they've ended up looking at. And they didn't start there. 
They didn't start anywhere near there. And, I, and when I, in my work with them, they've come back from it. So I'm, not, I'm really, really do think porn induced fetish is a very serious thing to be wary of. But to come back to it, these boys and their, their, the various types of, you know, gender issues they can have, these ROGD boys, some of them are definitely impacted in a very big way by what's going on on their screens and the, the trans and the trans porn and the ASMR power and, and things like that. But there's a whole other type who are kind of shutting down sexually and they, they, they kind of seek, I suppose, a feminine, softer way of living, I think. And those boys, I think, are are really badly served by being called autogynophiles and they're being dismissed. And the, the mothers, I think, are, are really wretchedly sad that nobody seems to understand their boy. And they're a type. They're so hilariously a type. They're all clever, as far as I can see. They're all quirky. They're all socially awkward. They're all, do you know what I mean? shy and it, it, it's such a type that they seem to be that it's 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 fascinating that one personality type is so deeply likely to to identify as trans at the moment i think that's that's really striking and gives a lot of food for thought mm-hmm. well we touched on this i think a little bit in episode four i mean there's something about the awkwardness of of these ROGD boys, um, they tend to be in, in my experience, they tend to be actually quite soft spoken, kind of shy, and they could easily get lost in the shuffle of, you know, teenage cliques and popularity and who's cool and who's not cool. And I think these are kind of wallflower kids that have a hard time, making their way in, in the social landscape. And so, you know, to be, to be able to adopt um, kind of a, a female persona and a female look, and then all of a sudden to be treated as the girls are treated, which, you know, I think for the most part, people do tend to be less hard on girls in some things, you know, not in everything, But if you are like learning how to do a new skill or something and you're seen as a girl, people are maybe like, oh, good job. You know, you did pretty good. You can do it next time. Whereas if if you're a boy amongst boys and you're trying to learn a new skill, they can be kind of tough on each other. So I do think there's a, you, you talked about living a gentler kind of life. And I do see that as being a thread that runs through some of these, um, young ROGD boys. Yeah. And, you know, they're kind of I know Kelly J. Keen Milchel, she wrote a piece about it saying that they were afraid of the locker room toxic masculinity. They don't see a place for themselves in there and there is no place for those boys there. And they don't find their tribe in maybe how they would have in other generations. They would have been that quiet, quirky boy who would have been into funny stuff. Generally, they, they used to I remember the boys in my generation, they used to kind of kind of learn vast swathes of comedy and repeat it to each other, Star Trek, things like that. But nowadays, I think they find each other online. And uh, the, the, it just, one thing I have noticed with these boys, the ROGD boys in, in this category is, is that they're, they're strikingly difficult, different from the ROGD girls in many ways. So the ROGD boys, for example, are quite insular and private about their gender and they want to be trans women and they want the drugs, they want the hormones and they've no interest in kind of a lot of the the extras that I think the girls are sometimes quite focused on. Now, I'd be interested in what your opinion of all this is, but this is what I've noticed, that the girls will agonise about whether they're non-binary or pangender or various different gender, genders, while the men, the, men, the boys... Are, are quite fixated on I'm a trans woman and I, I need to get my surgery and I need to get my my, my hormones and the, I don't need to talk about it. While I feel a lot of the girls, and I would say in, in quite a girlish way, the RGD girls want to talk about it. They, they often feel they're in a secret, but they want to talk about it and they want to agonize about it with everybody if they could and talk about all the different ways that whether they could be this and they could be that and they might be this. And it feels very 
ironically, male and female, that <laughs> the, the the Laura GD boys, are, I've nothing to talk about. I need to transition. I've nothing to say. And the girl is going, well, and it's this, <laughs> and it's that, and it's the other. And also the ROGD boys seem to be quite, they're in their bedroom. They're, they're in a refuge in nearly in their bedroom. And it's an insular private experience for them. And the hormones will, they'll emerge one day from their bedroom like a butterfly and they will be a trans woman. While the girls are much more interested in all the accessories that goes with becoming a trans boy. So that could be chest binders and it's the hair and it's the sweatshirt and it's the shoes. Just like other girls, you could argue, might have wore a, a full face of makeup. These girls won't leave home without their chest binders. Do, do you know what I mean? It's it's a lot about accessories. There's a lot of bits and pieces to being it. And I don't see that happen. Now, you can, you can put me straight, but this is what I've perceived so mm-hmm. far. Well, I, I think that what you're saying um, it certainly resonates that that would be a more very kind of prototypical feminine and masculine way to approach a problem right the masculine way i'm using air quotes here is find out what the solution is and run towards it and it's a very concrete materialistic kind of um experience and for the girl perhaps it's a little bit more you know um speculative and there's more questions involved and there's more wondering. Uh, And then on the other hand, though, I do see that for males who are, for males who are interested in, you know, a female gender identity, there are a lot of accoutrement, I guess, you know, there is the, the breast forms that you wear and then there's the voice training and then there's the, you know, way to stand and how to have your posture and what should your hair look like and all the body hair removal. So there is some, there is a lot of performative um, practice that has to go into it as well. I don't know if that's exactly what you're talking about, but I do see that. I think this is where it gets really interesting. And I think we have so much to study on this because I think there's a bit of an arc. So what I'm talking about is the initial, the initial identification. The girls are going, get me my stuff, get me my chest binder, get me all my boots. The boy goes, get me into my bedroom and I need to go into my mind yeah. and I will think about being a trans woman and I will get the drugs, I will get the hormones and that will be it. Then when they start to transition, this is how I've read the boys and I do hear about them in the parents meetings and and, and with the clients, but like when they start to transition, then they're like game on. Now I'm a real, it's like they don't think that they're a real girl until they get their hormones. And they're much more fixated on the hormones as yeah. a result in a very solution focused way. And you could say male way, but they, when I've, they've got the hormones, they think now I'm not pretending. Now it's the real thing. And now I'm allowed into the girl's mindset. Give me all the accessories. Give me all the accoutrement now. Because and they revel in them at that point, but they don't they almost don't let themselves. It's like they think it's pretending until they've started the transition, which makes them so intense because there's this kind of wall of silence from the OGD boys because they don't want to talk about it. They have nothing to talk about. It's I'm a trans woman and get me my hormones. And then when I get the hormones, I will then encapsulate and, and completely wear this identity. And I think the parents are just left with their jaws open going, what is going on? Like, he's not even remotely trying to be a a woman. He's just saying, get me the hormones. And then when they get them, they'll start. I don't know if this is your experience, but I have talked with several families where the boy um, went through some sort of kind of like a social, emotional or academic crisis So some, perhaps, you know, a kid who is always a straight A student, all of a sudden flunking out of a difficult course or having a long-term girlfriend who dumps him. And so upon experiencing this kind of crisis of identity, they end up spiraling down into like this really isolated place and they just become fixated on the idea of like 
almost like you said, reemerging out of their bedroom with the hormones and becoming this new person. Yeah. And it really seems to be almost like how sometimes males in their 40s or 50s can go through a midlife crisis. It almost seems like a young adolescent or young adult, you know, crisis of identity. And you're right, the fixation on the hormones can be very, very palpable. And it's really interesting. And of course, as the parental experience of this would be really scary. Like what is happening to my kid? All of a sudden, this young person is obsessed with one thing and one thing only, and it's a medical procedure. That is a very strange thing to parent through. Yeah. Um, I think that's such a good point about the adolescent crisis. And, you know, Lisa Lippman did hit upon that in her study about ROGD, didn't she? did, you know, speak about that and speak spoke about, you know, extended hours online and also, you know, some sort of crisis. And these boys very definitely, um, and it's notable just how clever they are. I know a lot of people say, oh, they're very clever, they're very clever. These boys just seem to be off the charts clever. And so it often is an actual intellectual crisis. It's often a kind of, and I thought I was the cleverest in the world and something went wrong with my identity as clever boy. I've noticed that it's often linked with that. And that's that's I've just noticed since since we've become, a, you know, I've written about it quite a lot in my in my earlier books. But like things like the kind of perfectionism of somebody who's very, very bright and the fear of failure of the person who's very, very bright. And they hit a wall, they hit a problem and they've never really had a performance problem with their intellect before. And it absolutely blindsides them devastates them. And then what do they do? They find a new identity. Yeah, that's really powerful. I mean, something else that just kind of popped up for me was thinking about, you know, we talked earlier about the power of like male sexuality when it develops, it can be, can be kind of ravenous and there may be listeners. Yeah. There may be listeners who say, no, it's all socially constructed. And you know, Maybe, but I I don't know about that. I think male sexuality, when it emerges, is very powerful. And it can be, in an embodied way, it can overwhelm the, the young person, the boy, who he himself is kind of a victim of his own body in a way, too, because they're young and they're not really sure how to figure things out. And one of the things I'm really aware of is that um, many of these boys, in my experience, are very conscientious and very egalitarian in their mindset. And so the last thing they want to do is be a creep or yeah. objectify a girl or be some kind of a predator. And so I wonder what kind of a position a boy might be in if he's himself becoming attracted to girls or becoming aroused by girls and yet at the same time really really conscious and cognizant of how that can be offensive or scary to a girl right like I think in a positive way young people are much more aware of how complicated sexual interactions between kids can be that as a boy you can't just you cannot just put your push yourself onto a girl and expect that that's okay. So thank goodness there's more awareness of that. And along with that, there are new anxieties now that perhaps boys haven't dealt with in the past. Um, so I'm really curious about not wanting to be some creepy cis guy or some pervert or, you know, not wanting to be a sexual harasser or a cat caller or whatever. Like there's all of this awareness now about the dynamics between males and females. So I, I think there are probably boys who are a little intimidated by their own sexuality and not sure what to make of it and don't really know how to own it in a way that is still egalitarian yet. And so they maybe go, well, I don't want to be a guy. I'll just be a girl. I'll be a lesbian. That's cool. Yeah. I think you're so right. And it's like, you know, when the, the look of disgust on a girl's face when she's like, I thought you were my friend and now you've just done that to me. That can derail a boy for, for years. Like that can absolutely devastate them. And, you you know, 
I see where the girl is coming from. I've been that girl where you push the boy off saying, sorry, I was just trying to yeah. walk by you. You absolute right. nutter. Like, yeah. so, so I can say on both sides, I can see how it happens. But it, it, those, those, and they're mummies boys, these boys, those mummies boys, they just, they're, they're, they're not tough enough really they're too soft and they just think oh I can't be that and she said I was a creep (laughs) I I just can't and it's so much easier for them to say no 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 I'm a trans woman and I'm a lesbian and oh I am not I'm a girl too like we're the same you don't have to be afraid of me I'm the same yeah yeah it's it's the self-blame you know um I'm aware that sometimes these young people boys included here, they're dealing with so much social anxiety that their default state is self-blame, you know? And it's so painful to walk around the world assuming you're wrong and you don't belong there and that everybody else is going to be annoyed by you or creeped out by you. or So they just feel, I think, sometimes very, very self-conscious and that process of being self-conscious and constantly self-monitoring, why not apply that to something, quote, productive, which is becoming more feminine or becoming a woman? Like, if you're going to monitor yourself all the time, maybe mm-hmm. you monitor yourself in a way that feels goal-oriented rather than just self-hating. That's where I think some of them might then easily be vulnerable to slipping into autogynophilia, that they could have started you know, in that place and then slipped in. Their sexual, you know, the sexual beast is growing and they could slip into it because it's like, oh, no, I'm a girl. And then they find that online and they go deeper in. And I think, I, I can predict it, I, I'm, I might be completely wrong, but I wouldn't be surprised if in a few years it turns out that there was a bit of an arc, that they didn't start with autogynophilia. They ended up with autogynophilia because of what they looked at because of you know because of it's 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 a really interesting kind of new type of kid who is is so awfully kind of badly um, misunderstood and when you said the egalitarian and the conscientious i've noticed a lot of them um like politically they they're they're horrified by being the cis white male that's one thing they cannot be and so they're, they're so determined. And we spoke a little bit about this with the um, with another, another episode talking about privilege. Privilege weighs very heavily on them. And that they're, they don't want to be part of the privileged class. And so being a, a, a trans lesbian is, is a much, it's a much more um, nicer place to be for them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, there's another kind of... Um, constellation here that I'm thinking about, which is that if if a young male is on the feminine side and perhaps he's gay and he grows up in, you know, a very homophobic culture or a very kind of machismo type of family, you know, his femininity may not be embraced. It may be the butt of jokes or criticism. Mm-hmm. And so like there are just so many different factors that can come into play and and maybe implant that seed of question in a person's mind of like, would I be better off if I transitioned? Am I not right as a, a boy this way? Or I do think there's a new thing that I'm a little bit uncomfortable with, and I might sound a bit regressive, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. So my little boy's 11 and he'd be playing, let's say, Fortnite or whatever those programs, those video games are. And in it... Um, he's automatically assigned a character and it's very often a girl. So he's automatically assigned that he is a girl in the video games. And so there he is, 10, 11, and that's, it's it's very much exactly when they will start the kind of, um, they start with cartoon porn, as far as I can see. And those, that awful porn industry lures them in with cartoon porn. But at the very same time, they're watching all these, and they're playing all these video games where they are assigned to be women. And those women are sexy ass women. They are mm. not. And so these sexy ass women, which they are. That, so there's my little boy playing that he is that woman. And I'm like, oh, let's stick that with anime. Stick that with deviant art. And stick that with cartoon porn, and I can actually see how this would evolve. Um, 
So, yeah, that was a bit of a revelation to me because I, I didn't know that they were, because I said to myself, why are you a girl? <laughs> that, that makes me sound really aggressive, but I, I, regressive, but I, I, I was a bit surprised that every time I looked at him playing, he was a girl. And I was like, why are you a, a girl? Mm-hmm. And he says, they just assign it to me. As in, you are- <laughs> assign, assign sex at gaming. <laughs> ASAG. Assigned <laughs> female at gaming. A F A G. Yeah, I, I, I just thought it was a whole point that I hadn't thought of. That like these kids, they're eleven and twelve. The, the, so much opens up at that very vulnerable age that I think it's something to throw into the pot of how. Because everybody, when they come into the meetings, these parents, they come in like kind of going, are they gay? What is it? And I'm like, not necessarily. Yeah. I, I don't see a massive proportion of these kids being gay. Do you? Yeah. No, I, I don't see a massive proportion. But then again, I just think, I think by definition, parents who contact me are a little bit shocked by their kids' gender dysphoria. And so I I, I do wonder and suspect and feel concerned that it's very plausible that any feminine boy is now identifying as trans and the parents haven't even blinked about it because they're like, well, yeah, did you not know him as a kid? He was so girly. So I, I, I just don't know how a feminine boy could really even make it right now without changing his, quote, gender identity. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure where where it's going to go from here because it feels so it feels so organized that the feminine boys you go in transition the feminine uh homosexuals you go in transition the uh it just feels very kind of done deal and the the, the, the like i say earlier the male kind of solution focused okay well that's what i am go for the solution move it on really makes the entire thing quite wrapped up quite quickly yeah Yeah, I think it'd be hard be hard to think otherwise and for the for the for for everybody who's trying to talk whether it's therapists or it's um parents or friends I find these boys the RGD boys they have no interest in chatting about it I find maybe you know you're a brilliant therapist so you probably say no Stella I get them chatting all the time you fool (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I do think there's an arc. You mentioned that earlier. I 100% agree. And this applies to both boys and girls. And I think this is a, I guess, for the any parents listening, I would say, one, buckle in, because this is a really long process. This is not something that will come and go overnight, in my experience. And two, there's there's an arc by which I think initially kids come out really with very, very strong demands, most of them medical and then, you know, things tend to cool off a little bit over time once boundaries are, are set. But I think in my experience, when you first start working with a, a boy of, uh, a, of teenage age who's struggling with gender, initially there's nothing to talk about. You're right. They don't really want to talk. It's all about medical solutions and this is what I need. And yet I have found that over time, I mean, a lot of the work we do is long-term in in my experience. Over time, there's so many interesting things to talk about, but it's really difficult to, um, to navigate all of these complicated factors while this cultural concept of like, well, actually this is just a different gender identity. You put that in the mix and it becomes really challenging sometimes to do real depth work. But I, I, you know, I wanted to talk about what, what sexuality development looks like for boys, because we've touched on it and we, I just think something really interesting comes to my mind. So when you think about what boys typically start to become attuned to at this age, it's their desire of girls. And yet they also I don't think there's a place for boys to figure out how they themselves can be quote sexy. Does that um, make sense? Yeah. So does. like, I think girls who are trying to figure that out, there's an interplay between like, who are you attracted to? But also girls try to figure out how to make themselves attractive to others. 
And boys sometimes try to make themselves attracted to girls by like being funny or being charismatic or being strong or being this or being that. But I think that there's something about being desirable that is channeled through trying to be a girl because girls are considered desirable. I mean, we, we touched on this a little bit before, but you know, like when you try to look in the mirror, if you've always felt like kind of an ugly guy that nobody likes and all of a sudden you can be hot, like there's something to that. And I think it's maybe in their imagination, it's easier to, to understand what a hot girl is compared to like, what is that quote hot guy? Well, I don't know. Yeah. What do you think? I think that's a really good point. A really good point that has a lot of legs <laughs> because I kind of think, <laughs> no well, pun what? intended. <laughs> yeah. But what, <laughs> what does a, a, a guy who wants to look hot for his girlfriend, he wears a t-shirt and jeans. Like, a, you know, the, he has nothing to, to dress himself up with. He has nothing that he can do to kind of, pull out all the stops oh he'll wear his favorite t-shirt and he'll, he'll you know <laughs> it's, it's so limited yeah. and with the girls it's the sky's the limit there's so much they can do and one could argue it becomes a pressure and there's too much to do and stuff like that but yeah that that I think that's a really really good point I do wonder uh, on another point just to go back a little bit to, to autogynephilia when you're when you're working with autogynephilia I'm not sure that there's much buy-in from the from the person, you know what I mean, from the boy, because I don't think he particularly wants to, um, or I don't think he wants to do anything except transition. And so if somebody is tipped into autogynephilia, I'm not sure where you can go therapeutically, which does make it, I, I, I'd say I'm more intimidated by the, boys the boys who 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 seek to transition than the girls because I can completely understand where the girls are at for so many different reasons but with the boys I I find there's a few leaps here that I have to make and I I feel I have to do more work in understanding them which I think makes it all the more satisfying when it works but definitely more intimidating at the start yeah you really have to approach I think cases like this with a lot of humility just coming from the perspective that like I'm here to try and understand what your experience is of this. And I don't want to make too many leaps. I want to really understand it. Now, of course, there are always moments where you see a client's defense mechanisms, you know, and their cognitive dissonance and how their rationalizations come in or justification. So you have to still have um, a clinical eye on on the conversation and how it unfolds. But I think you're right that there's so much that's a little bit mysterious about this experience. I mean, A, we're both females, so we don't know what it's like to have a male body, to be a male person in the world. Um, And it it certainly feels kind of mysterious to have that experience of oneself to the point where, you know, you're, you're ready to throw in the towel and change everything that that's quite profound. Yeah. And I'm, I really don't know. I mean, I'm not certainly not an expert. I've worked a little bit with this population, but, you know, I think somebody like Ray Blanchard or Mike Bailey would be able to kind of cue us in, though they're not clinicians. They they have conducted lots and lots of interviews. And one thing that I think has uh, been really fascinating for me is more and more YouTube accounts have cropped up where young men are describing themselves as having autogynephilia and talking about their experiences and trying to kind of give the viewers a a look inside of that entire condition. And it's quite fascinating. And I'm, I'm really in awe of these young men because wow, what absolute self ownership to be able to talk about this experience in a way that is not self-denigrating, it is not um, overly yeah. sensational. It's just you know these honest accounts. Now it's performative, right? So I don't know how much of these YouTube accounts are a hundred percent exactly accurate. However, I find it really inspiring to see young men trying to talk about their experiences, and it seems as though being able to name it and call it out kind of like the, the, the healing element of reality and truth is something very powerful because I think 
to, to at least be able to describe what's actually happening to you rather than this kind of umbrella explanation of like, oh, I just have a different gender identity. Yeah. I think the reality of it is, is helpful. And the reality of it is often complex and it often brings about a lot of pain. And if we could live in a world where people could just be able to discuss where they're coming from with their trans identity without all this shame and pain. And I have to say, like, I don't want to finish this episode without saying that, like, some of us women are so harsh on, and I know there's an awful lot of distress. I know there's an awful lot of, 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 of awful behavior from an awful lot of different groups, but the kind of the utter disgust from some women towards men and I kind of think well I had my experiences as I explained in the shop and stuff and I was you know basically made to be part of somebody's sex act regularly so I I I I get it but at the same time where do we go when there's a certain number of people who 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 definitely have this fetish where do we go with that where do we go as a society with that because shaming people doesn't really work Mm -hmm. so we have to go somewhere other than shaming them. And I think talking about it, as far as I know, is there anything better than just talking about it and trying to bring it out into the sunlight? Because I'm not sure there's anywhere else we can go with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think think it's really difficult because lots of people have had their own personal experiences with these types of fetishes or issues and so I think yeah yeah yeah, really really horrifying experiences so I think if somebody still feels like they're kind of in the trenches of their own trauma it's really hard to get that bird's eye view and and you know remove themselves to enough safety and enough distance to be you know um, maybe more neutral or even more compassionate I mean at the end of the day and you know I, I also I also think part of what we're trying to do here is just talk in as honest of a way as possible about these experiences because they are complicated and they can cause hurt to certain people in in a person's life. And yet they are also the experiences of an individual who's trying to sort through that particular sexual inclination or fetish, or even if it's just an identity question. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. This podcast is partially sponsored by RIME, Rethink Identity Medicine Ethics. RIME is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the long-term care for gender-variant individuals. Visit rethinkime.org to learn more. If you found value in our show, please review us on iTunes and subscribe so you never miss an episode. And you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. Just go to our link tree. That's linktr.ee slash wider lens pod. Our discussions are for educational purposes only and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services.